What are the best settings for this monitor? And by best settings, I mean the settings I adopted as my test settings in my review. So they worked on my unit according to my own preferences and the color emitter targets, which I usually go for for consistency in my reviews. Individual units and preferences will vary. Just a few quick notes before getting into the settings. I do like the feel of the joystick, which is the main method on the monitor used to control the OSD. The indentation just fits the finger I use to control it nicely. It's difficult to describe. It's suitably grippy, but at the same time, a slightly silky feeling. Never thought I'd describe any aspect of a monitor in that way, but here we are. And obviously it's pretty subjective. You might notice that my menu's in the middle of the screen, my OSD display, that's because I've changed it in the menu system to be there rather than the bottom right. Just for the sake of the video, it's a bit clearer. When it's at the bottom right, because of the curve of the screen, it looks a bit weird and distorted. So the first thing here is the game mode. I'd recommend leaving that at standard. You can use another setting if you want, but a lot of the time you'll find that things are greyed out, like the brightness, which is a really obnoxious thing to grey out. You can use game one or game two, so you can see there you can customise the brightness, contrast and relative gamma there. And those settings are also available to use in the screen settings part of the menu. So really I'm just saying for flexibility, use game one, game two or standard. Next you've got Adaptive Sync. If you're using DisplayPort, it's called Adaptive Sync. If you're using HDMI, it'll call itself FreeSync Premium Pro, I believe. Either way, it's an Adaptive Sync toggle. You can use VRR, HDMI 2.1 VRR, regardless of whether you have this set to on. But if you want to use Adaptive Sync to use AMD FreeSync Premium Pro, or NVIDIA G-Sync compatible when you're using DisplayPort, then just leave this set to Auto. DSC, that was off by default on my unit, and that meant that I was restricted in terms of the bandwidth. So if you've got it hooked up to a GPU, which you know is capable of running 240 hertz, 3440 by 1440, and it isn't working, make sure DSC is set to on. If you specifically don't want to use DSC and you want to disable it, that's why this option exists. Next in screen settings, I set brightness to 45. That was appropriate for my own preferences, and it got kind of close to the 160 nit target I generally go for for consistency in my reviews. I say kind of because this monitor has a bit of a mind of its own when it comes to brightness. You can't tame the ABL automatic brightness limiter behavior, and it will happily brighten and dim depending on the image that's being displayed. So it's only really close to 160 nits with certain images being displayed. Sometimes it's gonna be dimmer than that, sometimes significantly brighter. But this is all covered in the review. Either way, you're gonna be setting the brightness according to your own preferences and lighting. Some people might like to use ambient light detection, so that uses the ambient light sensor, but as you'll see, it grays off your brightness setting. And for me, this is always too bright with ambient light detection on, obnoxiously bright at times, uncomfortably bright in my view. It doesn't really matter what my room lighting's doing. If it's quite dim in my room, it's brighter than I'd like. If it's bright in my room, it's brighter than I'd like. If you like to use that kind of setting, worth trying it out and see if it suits your preferences, but the lack of flexibility is quite an oversight in my opinion. I'm also going to mention Dark Boost, not because I changed this, I had it set to level 4, which is the default setting, but just because they've labelled it in a confusing way. Usually level 4 would be the highest Dark Boost setting, the strongest Dark Boost, the biggest enhancement, which gives you the biggest uplift of detail. In this case, level 4 is actually the base level, and when you go down the levels, it actually increases the effect. It gives you more of a boost, which is completely counterintuitive, but that's how they've labelled it. And everything else I'm not mentioning, I did indeed leave it default. And that includes the contrast at 75. Next you've got colour settings. I didn't have to make any changes there on my unit. Using the default colour temperature warm worked very well. Got close to 6500k white point with a good neutral green channel. But this monitor is a bit peculiar as I explore it in the review because the colour temperature depends on the brightness. So as the monitor gets brighter or you set it to a higher brightness setting in the OSD, then it becomes cooler. If you use a lower brightness setting in the OSD, then it becomes warmer, regardless of what you've got the colour temperature set to. So my advice would be to set the brightness you want to use first and then set the colour temperature setting according to your preferences. For some people though, the best setting will actually be to set the color temperature to sRGB, which is an sRGB emulation setting, which will give more faithful reproduction to most content, which is designed with the sRGB color space in mind. And it does give a good clamp for the sRGB color space. However, you don't get any control of the red, green, and blue color channels, which I find quite strange because they do give you the six axis color, so you can change the hue and saturation. You just can't change your main red, green, and blue gain controls, which is really the main thing you'd want to adjust here. You can't adjust the contrast either, but you can adjust the brightness. So that's what I changed for SDR. I did make some changes in OLED care, but I'm gonna cover that separately. So game mode set to standard, adaptive sync auto, or FreeSync Premium Pro set to auto, DSC set to on, brightness set to 45, dark boost left at level four, and color temperature left at warm.
I'm now going to enable HDR and Windows and cover the HDR settings of the monitor. is isn't really much to cover here, but I do want to go through a few things. So I like to use the Windows HDR calibration tool just to give an idea of the relative brightness calibrations under HDR for monitors with various modes and settings. So the first bit of that, you can have it completely at zero because it's an OLED. For the next bit, at least on my unit, regardless of the HDR setting you're using or the HDR mode you're using, it reports the brightness as 1200 nits. That is correct for the high brightness HDR modes. So that is HDR movie, HDR photo and HDR game. But if you have HDR set to auto, it is again reported in the same way, but actually the brightness is not gonna to go to 1200 nits. It's gonna be capped at 450 nits. Remember that in-game calibration sliders should show similar behavior to this, but that can depend on the game and how they've set the HDR calibration options up. But just remember either way, this tool gives an indication of the relative calibration of the screen, not the actual brightness levels you've experienced. So as I mentioned, the auto setting, that's limited to 450 nits. That's because it's your Display HDR True Black 400 style setting. And that provides a consistent experience, but with a limited peak brightness. So ideally this wouldn't be reported in the same way as the high brightness mode. So this should be reported as 450 nits. In practice, this mismatch using the auto setting is fine as long as you calibrate the HDR in the game or using this Windows tool correctly. It's usually pretty straightforward if the calibration includes a nice visual guide like the Windows tool I'm using here, and some in-game calibrations will do the same. But remember that any in-game maximum brightness figures should be set to 1200 if they use a numerical value, even for the auto setting that can't come anywhere close to that in reality. If you watch a lot of HDR movie content or you play games that don't have an in-game HDR calibration facility or a poor one, and you want to use the restricted brightness auto setting, then it's probably worth running through the Windows HDR calibration tool and using the profile it creates for HDR. If you're just using the high brightness modes, I wouldn't really bother, but you can still run through the tool if you wish and just see if you prefer that. It shouldn't make any dramatic changes to your experience though. So I've been Shadow of the Two Mader, HDR game running HDR10 content, which the monitor supports just to show you a few things. You'll notice that a lot of the menu is grayed out now. For example, you can't adjust the brightness. It is this HDR setting, which is the only thing you're really gonna focus on here. So out of the high brightness modes, of course, auto is its own thing, as I've mentioned, but for the high brightness modes, I don't like HDR photo because it noticeably oversaturates the image. The red of Lara's dress is completely overdone. Those greens have too much pop to them and look a bit cartoonish. HDR game is even worse. Lara's skin now looks like it's on fire. Uh, and the earthy browns don't look earthy brown, they look kind of orange. And there's some very bright greens which look completely out of place. Thankfully the movie setting is more toned down and more appropriate. So that is my preference. Nothing else to talk about because there's nothing else to change here in HDR. But if you do want a boost of saturation, remember you could use the HDR photo setting. If you want a strong boost of saturation, that's where HDR game comes in. I'm now going to cover the OLED care settings and I'm actually going to stay in game in HDR just for change because these settings do apply under HDR as well as SDR. Smart panel brightness, you'll be able to see when I turn that on or you might be able to see this vignetting towards the corners of the screen and the edges. It dims those. It doesn't change the brightness of the central region of the screen. This is something that LG Display, who makes the panel, will sometimes call convex power control or CPC. You can try it if you like, but to me, it's just like having a monitor with really bad uniformity, which you really shouldn't expect from an OLED. I prefer keeping it off. There's smart pixel adjustment, and that's set to normal by default, but I've set it to slow. That's because I found with normal, it was moving the screen a little bit too much for my liking. So this just nudges it up, down, left and right within its active area, the over provisioning of pixels. This is a common image retention mitigation method used on OLEDs, just moves the image every now and then. So I did find it too aggressive set to normal. It was certainly better set to slow, but even then I did find it quite noticeable when the movement occurred if I was on the desktop. You can have this set to normal if you don't mind it, or even fast if you don't mind that with fast being the most aggressive setting, which will cause movement of the image most frequently. Next, I'm gonna cover the screen protection feature, and that runs the usual voltage cycling for the panel or pixel refresh style feature of the monitor to help mitigate image retention. The monitor will try to run this after every four hours of cumulative use, and that's regardless of other settings you've selected, such as the screen protection notice, which you can set to an interval of six hours, eight hours, or have it off. And that will show a message like this in the middle of the screen, so remember that if you don't want this message popping up, you can disable it. 
You can run the cycle manually when that message appears, or you can select screen protection like I did there and then run the cycle. But if it is due to run and you don't manually activate it, then it'll run when the monitor isn't on. So that means the screen has gone into standby because of Windows power management. If a signal's lost because you've shut down your system, or if you try to turn the monitor off using the power button. And the power indicator should flash orange for the duration of the cycle whilst it's running. The refresh cycle can be interrupted by pushing in the joystick or perhaps pressing other buttons on the monitor to interact with it if you need to. It's supposed to last around five minutes. The other way that it can activate the cycle if it needs to run is using smart user detection. So you have that set to off, which disables it five minutes, 10 minutes or 15 minutes. What that does is it uses the proximity sensor to turn the screen off if nobody's present and it allows the screen protection cycle to run. I found it worked well with this set to five minutes and I usually sit around 70 centimeters or so from the screen. How well it works could depend on your viewing distance and your position. The screen turned off after the selected time interval, so five minutes in my case, but it took several seconds to resume normal operation if the cycle was running and you returned to the screen. Once the cycle's run, the screen switches back on to its on state, regardless of the user being present or not, and the proximity sensor only has a useful function once the cycle is actually due to be run again several hours later. It does seem odd to me that there's no option to use that proximity sensor to shut the screen off even if the refresh rate cycle isn't due to run. That's really just good OLED hygiene. You don't leave the screen on when you're not using it. Just a few things to go through now. Visibility enhancement, that's where the dark boost setting comes in. So if you don't have that set to level four, I'm just gonna show you the effect with the Legom, Legom.nl black levels test. So that's level one, level two, level three, level four. So it certainly is gonna improve your visibility and potentially give you a competitive edge in games, but it would have been better if it had more of an effect on the darkest shades here. It doesn't affect black though, so it doesn't affect your contrast. The other option, if you want a boost, would be to change relative gamma to minus 0 0.4. And that does give a bit of a boost again, although the very darkest shades are still fairly well blended. And last but not least, that would be setting color temperature to sRGB, which is your sRGB emulation mode, and it also uses sRGB gamma tracking. And that does give a very good uplift, and it gives you good visibility to those dark shades. And you should give a quick demonstration of any on-screen crosshairs, but this monitor doesn't include that feature. An important feature for this monitor, though, but it's one that they've done very well anyway, is the KVM functionality. You get 140 watts of power delivery over USB-C on this monitor, which is very generous, especially for a gaming monitor. And if you go to port selection, KVM selection, that's how you can set this up. I'm not gonna show you this in detail. I just wanted to show you the options that are available to you. So you can have the KVM selection on or off. Having that set to off will disable the KVM button, which is the dedicated button just below the joystick. You can set USB-C priority on or off. So it should auto select USB-C if that's set to on preferentially if it's doing that, if it's trying to automatically select the signal. And you can set up the display which is used for your USB-C source and also your USB-B source. So that's your USB-B upstream port. And when you've set that all up to your liking, you can then press that KVM button. If you don't want to use the KVM feature and you're not really interested in that, the button doesn't completely go to waste because if you hold it in for a few seconds, I think it's five seconds, it'll just quickly get up your game settings menu.